I've been dealing with the paranormal my whole life. From shadow figures standing over me at night, or unexplained sounds, to things suddenly falling over, even though all the doors and windows are shut. It never really bothered me much, because it didn't affect me directly, so I thought that it was just part of life somehow. This experience took place when I was 14 or 15. It was Halloween, and my siblings and myself all shared a liking for things creepy and unexplained. My brother had bought a Ouija board a couple months prior, and asked my sister and me to play with him on Halloween. We of course agreed. My brother made a circle out of candles, and put the board in the middle. My sister and I sat on one side of the board, and my brother on the other. We started warming up the board before we asked questions. After warming up the board, my brother asked the first question. We all agreed that we'd take turns. He asked if anyone was there, and at first nothing happened. So my sister asked the next question, what his or her name was. This time we got an answer, yes. Having never done this before, I thought one of them was pushing the planchet. Both swore that they weren't pushing it. I asked the next question, and we again got an answer. The ghost said his name, but I can't recall what it was. I do, however, remember it was Russian. We continued to ask it questions, like where he lived and how old he was, if he had family, and things like that. Harmless things, and he answered all of them politely. After the sixth or seventh question, I started to feel really cold, like ice cold. I asked my brother if he had turned the radiator off, and he said no. I asked my sister if she was feeling cold, and she too said no. I brushed it off and concentrated on the game again. My brother then asked when he had died, and it turned out that he had died in 1994. I was really intrigued at this point. So I asked how he had died, and this is where everything tipped. After I asked him this question, I immediately got a fuck you spelled out. Getting slightly uncomfortable, I apologized, and my sister asked a harmless question again, but she got a fuck off. My brother then asked if he was here in this room with us, and if so, where exactly? The ghost spelled out, behind Victoria. At this, my skin started crawling, and I wanted to stop playing. My sister and brother both looked in shock. My brother's phone then started ringing, of course with the freaking Halloween soundtrack, so we all jumped. My brother turned over the planchet and went to answer it. I immediately got up and left the room to calm down, and we never spoke of this event again. Let me start off by saying that I've never considered myself a superstitious person who believes in ghost stories. In fact, I'm the type of individual who desires evidence and facts over anything else. A see to believe kind of girl. What I am about to tell you might seem made up or over exaggerated, but believe me if you can, it's not even, even though I truly wish it was. I don't remember experiencing a paranormal event in my lifetime. That is, until recently. Which, by the way, didn't take place all in one moment in one exact location. This creeps me out even more. And whatever I saw and heard will haunt me for a very long time. Now, I live in a very safe upper middle class neighborhood in Maryland. I never hear of robberies, rapes, or murders happening in this specific area where I live, and certainly have had no personal encounters. This is why I am fairly convinced that what I imagine I faced was in the category of ghostly phenomena. This story begins one early morning in the week of May 2016. I remember feeling restless because of my whack sleeping schedule. I tend to like staying up late and sleeping during the day. I have been getting a sufficient amount of sleep, it's just my sleep patterns have been flipped recently. Living on my own in Lancaster while attending college, 
is partially to blame. But I am back home for the summer and trying to fix that issue. So that is why, on this night, I am restless and agitated, tossing and turning in bed while my parents and sister are sleeping peacefully through the night. It's still dark, so I look at the time on my phone, and it's 5.30 a.m., and I am wide awake. I decide the best thing to do is go and walk around for a little while, and read downstairs until I get drowsy. I tiptoe downstairs, and try to be as stealthy as possible, as to not disturb my family in their slumber. However, every step I take is creaking and squeaking because our house is moderately old, but sturdy nonetheless. I made my way down to the first level, and walked quietly through the main hallway to the back room. Half of this space is an open style kitchen slash dining area, and the other half is a living room. In the middle, dividing these two sections, are glass doors with trim leading to a small deck in the backyard. I turn on the lights nearest to the back doors, and sit on one of the couches. I pick up a photo book my sister and I made, and begin flipping through each page, one by one. After a minute passes by, I hear something strange, a tapping noise. I look out the window to check to see if it's raining or drizzling outside, and it's not. I listen more intently and try to pinpoint where the noise is coming from, and I notice it's close, uncomfortably close, in one concentrated area in fact. It sounds like it's coming directly from the other side of the glass doors. There are door jams on both sides, and the tapping appears to be coming from the vinyl siding next to the door. Steady tapping persists, and I peek out to see if it's an animal, but I see nothing. As I get a closer look, the noise stops abruptly. I can see everything in plain sight. There are no blind spots, and the light is on, so I'm confused as to what I heard, but decide to shrug it off as me being paranoid. I sit back down and open the photo book again. A few seconds later the noise starts up again, but this time it's not on the vinyl, but instead on the glass of the door directly behind me. This time my adrenaline kicks in, and the sound sends shivers down my spine. My eyes steer my head in the direction of the noise, turning around and facing the doors the tapping only grows louder and closer to me. I see nothing there. It makes no sense and I cannot fathom the moment in my mind. At this point, I am freaking out and bolt down the hall, up the stairs and into my room quickly shutting the door behind me as I quiver in fear. I get back into bed and hesitantly peek out my window facing the backyard. The neighbor's backyard is directly across from us, bordered by a fence from our yard. They have their beam lights on. It's so bright that some of the light is shining in our yard as well. My eyes are well adjusted to the darkness, and can see if there's any suspicious activity going on. I am hoping there's no person trying to break into our home. I peer along the yard and the neighbor's yard for a few minutes, and suddenly my eyes spot movement around the fence. The light helps significantly where I notice this happening. I blink several times for clarity to try and comprehend what I'm seeing. There is definitely movement taking place. However, I cannot piece together who or what it is exactly. I don't see movements of leaves or the weight of footsteps on the ground. This thing appears to be levitating as if it weighs nothing at all. I think I'm losing my mind. I look away and back and keep seeing this creature I cannot recognize as anything normal. It is small, black, yet somehow transparent and is moving in and out through the holes in the fence. As I keep staring, it even curves over the fence, back and forth, up, down, then moves into the yard to suddenly evaporate into thin air. I am not sleep deprived, and I know I am not hallucinating because I basically slept all of yesterday. I am baffled and scared, but at the same time, fascinated. My heart is pounding. I close the curtain and hide like a child under my covers. My eyes are wide as the adrenaline is still pumping through my body. What just happened? I contemplate this for hours until I drift off to sleep. 
I wake up at around 4 p.m. and am hesitant to tell my family about my paranormal experience. I tell my sister that day, and she is intrigued, but skeptical at the same time. I knew she would be. A couple days pass, and my parents, sister, and I are heading to New York City for vacation. Since I told my sister of what happened, I thought I should also inform my mom and dad. I do, in minimal detail, and I receive a polite response, but can tell they don't believe me, as if I was just being paranoid. Around 10 p.m. we arrive in New Jersey and stay at a hotel for a night before commuting another hour the next morning into New York City. My sister and I share a room in a comfort suites hotel, and by this point, I try to convince myself that the bizarre ghost-like encounter was a one-time thing and that I should just let it go and move on. I take some NyQuil, turn off the lights, and get under the covers and try to fall asleep. After a couple minutes I notice myself dozing off, but not for long. I have anxiety and panic attacks every now and again, the kind where you feel like you're falling off a cliff or that your life is escaping your body. Yeah, this happens now and again, but it's nothing unusual. Well, this night it is different. I am comfortably falling asleep until suddenly my eyes open wide and I gasp for air in a state of panic. As I do, I see something. Towering over me, next to my bed, is a tall, dark, semi-transparent figure, very similar to what I thought I saw in my backyard the other night. I flinch backwards in fear. I blink a couple times and all of a sudden it disappeared before my very eyes. Is this thing trying to torment me? Follow me? What is happening? Knowing that my sister is only feet away, brings me comfort and a sense of security. I sigh heavily and eventually fall asleep. I attempt to suppress these events, which all took place within a week's time frame. Successfully, during my stay in New York, I distract myself and have a good time. My family and I drive back home the following week and thoughts of the ghost creep back. Each night before I go to bed, I peek out my window to satisfy my curiosity, but have seen nothing since I arrived home. From now on, I hope I hear no cringe evoking noises or awaken to a towering ghost beside my bed trying to haunt me in my sleep. Things are back to normal. For now. When I was about eight or nine, my mom and I lived alone in a small house. I was not a particularly paranoid kid, but I did require a nightlight in order to fall asleep. Usually, I would fall asleep with my bedroom door and my closet door open with the light on in my closet as a nightlight. One morning, I woke up at about 4 a.m. for what I thought was no reason. I just lay there, waiting to fall asleep, when I heard what must have woken me up a whisper whispering my name. I sat up and looked around, and then heard it again. Thinking it was my mom calling me, I got up and went to her room and opened the door. Mom, did you call me? She'd clearly been sleeping soundly. No, sweetheart, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. But someone called my name. She gave me a few half-assed explanations on what it could have been to get me back to bed including a bird that can mimic humans or a religious experience. My mom has always been a very conservative and religious woman, and she usually didn't believe the things that I told her. I must have been satisfied with her answer, because I went back to bed. Of course, a few moments later after I got back into bed, I heard my name being whispered again. For whatever reason, I decided to say, Hello? What do you want? But I got no reply. I thought I had pinpointed the source of the voice. It sounded like it was coming from my closet, so I went to investigate, but there was nothing there. This didn't really scare me, though it did unsettle me a bit. I just decided to go back to bed and didn't hear it again that night. On another night, several months later, I was sitting on my bed reading a textbook for school when I saw something out of the corner of my eye. 
I looked quickly, I guess expecting that there was nothing there, because then I looked down at my textbook, realizing too late what I had just seen. Even though I only caught a glimpse for a moment, the memory is burned into my mind. Leaning out of my closet and grinning at me was a man, or something close to a man. Its skin was black and brown, and it was bald, resembling a burnt corpse, and its eyes were red and bloodshot. I immediately looked back up from my book, doing a double take, but it was gone. There was no way anything natural could have disappeared so quickly. I immediately fled my room, but I never mentioned this to my mother because I knew she would never believe me or give me some kind of lecture. When I returned to my room once I had calmed down, there was nothing in my closet. I lived in that house for several years after that and never experienced anything worth mentioning again. But needless to say, I never slept with that closet door open again. This happened to me a while ago, over a course of a few years, from when I was in fifth grade all the way up to my freshman year. We moved into a two-story house with a big pool and a big yard. I have three siblings, all younger than me. When we first saw the house, we loved it, just because it had a pool. My mom did too. My dad, however, had this creepy vibe from the house. We brushed it off though. During the first year of us living there, it was okay to say the least. We always had this creepy feeling we were being watched, especially in the basement, where my room was, and in my sister's room on the top floor. Strange things occurred that year. My dog would just stare off into the part of the room or down the hallway and growl and bark at times. Items would be placed where they shouldn't have been, and so forth. Fast forward to winter of sixth grade. It was getting freezing cold in my room, so I bunked with my brothers in their room on the top floor. Right next to my brother's room was my parents' room. My sister's room was down the hall, closest to the stairs. It was late, about 11 or 12 at night. I was the only one up watching Dragon Ball Z. When I turned the TV off and started to fall asleep, I was startled to hear my sister screaming and crying bloody murder. It woke everyone up. My dad and I rushed out of our rooms to my sister's room. From how she was screaming, you would have thought someone was abducting her. We even expected to see someone talking to her. But when we got there, it was just my sister standing on her bed crying. Diagonal from her was her closet, which was open. When we asked her what was wrong, she told us that a little boy wearing a mask with blood red eyes was in her closet. She said he likes to hide in there, away from everyone else. This freaked me and the rest of my family out, but we thought it was just a bad dream. Until it happened two more times, and it was odd that she was seeing a boy. The only death we found that occurred in the house was an old man who passed from a heart attack. No children. My sister refused to sleep in her own room ever again, unless she had someone in there with her. Skip ahead to 7th grade. My great-grandmother had suffered her second stroke. She wasn't going to make it, so my family brought her home so she would at least be comfortable for her last days. When she finally passed on April 28th, three weeks after my birthday, we buried her and life was a little hard, but we carried on. A few months after her death, I was sitting down at the kitchen table. My dad was changing my little cousin's diaper. My sister, out of nowhere, got really excited and pointed and screaming at the kitchen sink, yelling, Micah home! Micah is home! My dad and I looked at each other confused, then asked her, What do you mean Micah's home, sissy? My sister said, She's right there, standing at the sink looking at us. Me and my dad looked back at each other with the look of, what the hell? Then my sister looked sad and said that Micah left. At this point, the feelings of being watched had stopped, as well as everything else I had said earlier. But after that day, the feeling of calm in the house left and things got bad. Things took a turn for the worst in eighth grade. There was a negativity in the house a tension I couldn't explain. Like, this feeling of dread that left you once you walked outside. 
my family became very short-tempered, including myself. My dog would growl and bark at nothing, and he would never leave the room we were in. My parents fought more than I had ever seen, and they eventually divorced. I started having really bad nightmares, and the worst part was that they felt so real. One time, I dreamt I was in my room. It was dark and I heard all whispers around me. I ran up the stairs to the kitchen, but before reaching the top, something grabbed my ankle and pulled me down the steps. I clawed and fought, but was dragged down, all the way to the section of the basement that was closed off for the laundry. That's when I woke up, and noticed hand marks on my ankles where I had been pulled. I freaked out, and the nightmares just kept getting worse. One night that I can remember, sealed it. I had another nightmare about being locked in my room, and from my window I could see my parents and siblings leaving, and I was screaming for them to come back and help me, but they couldn't hear me. When I woke up, I saw a shadowy figure standing near the corner of my room. It was just there, looking at me. I darted from my bed and ran upstairs. Before I reached the top step, I felt a slap on the heel of my foot. I got to the top, slammed the door, and went to the back room where my dog slept, turned on the TV, and refused to sleep the rest of the night. My dog growled in the direction of the hall leading back to the kitchen for a good while, then eventually stopped. We moved out of there a month later, when my mom couldn't afford to keep the house and got a nice apartment. The feeling of anger and dread never hung over me again like a cloud like it had done for so long. Everyone got a lot better after moving out of that place. I am a senior this year, and to this day the house is vacant. The city it's in is extremely expensive, but my dad and I were shocked to see it online selling for 100000 cheaper than it was worth. The house was just rotting away, despite all the work we'd put into it when we lived there. I talked to my brothers about it a week ago, just reflecting upon it. They told me they saw the same shadowy figure in their room as well. One of my brothers thought that he saw a shadow smile at him once. My sister doesn't really like to talk about the boy with the mask. She did, however, tell me he played hide and seek with an old man. She said he was nice and looked a lot like my grandpa who had died before my sister was even born. She said she played only one time when she found him hiding under the bed. She told me that his demeanor wasn't scary, but she said that he claimed he was trying to scare her but she wasn't scared. To this day, I'm glad I don't live there anymore, and I hope no one else lives there. Ever. I am almost 50 now, but I still remember that night in October 1982, when I was a senior in high school. I'd been out, and by the time I got home, my parents were already in bed. I sat and watched TV for a while, then I headed to bed at about 12.30 or so. I hadn't been down long when I heard what sounded like someone walking in the attic above me. At first, I tried to tell myself that it was just a squirrel in between the ceiling and the attic floor. That had happened before. It didn't sound like squirrels, though. It sounded like a man in heavy boots walking from one end of the crossbar of our T-shaped attic to the other right above my room. Then it stopped. I don't know how long, but I do remember I'd started to drift off when the pacing started again. This time, it went from one end of the crossbar to the other, and then back to the top of the T-stem. The attic stairs began there. The stem was over the hallway and my parents' bedroom. The steps went down the stem, back up, back across the crossbar, over my room, then back stopping at the top of the attic stairs. I was scared, but I wasn't thinking ghost. I was thinking someone had broken into our house earlier in the evening and was either checking out what was good to steal, or worse. When the boot steps started down the attic steps, I panicked. I sat up, because the attic door is right next to my bedroom. Even though it's locked, it would have been nothing to boot open the door. I sat there, looking at the attic door, the footfall stopping at the bottom step. It was silent for what seemed like forever, but was probably only 10 seconds or so. 
that's when I saw and heard the door handle to the attic twist back and forth. Slowly at first, then faster. That stopped. Now, the house is old. The attic door is not all the way flush with the top of the door jamb. Near the opposite side of the hinges, there's a gap about an inch and a half wide. While I was sitting there, I saw fingers slip through the gap and hold the door. Except they weren't really fingers. For one, they glowed with this dull white glow. For another thing, they were all dried up. Knuckle bones stuck through the skin. Suddenly, the door started shaking violently and very loud. I was terrified, but I couldn't stop looking. Then I heard my father's roar from their bedroom. What the hell is going on down there? The door stopped shaking, and I watched the fingers slide back inside the gap. I fall back in bed, turning away from the doorway. I heard my father come out and down the hall, stopping and looking in my room to see if I'd been the one making all that crazy racket. Then I heard him snap the lock to the attic door, and all I could think was, Don't go up there. Don't go up there. But he went up there. I could hear him pounding around the attic. A minute or so later, my mother came out of the bedroom and called him back downstairs. By that time, I was sitting up again. My father asked me if I'd heard something, and I admitted that I had. My mother insisted it was nothing but a dream, and urged Dad to come back with her to bed. As he left with her guiding him, my father gave me a look and said, You know what happened, and I know what happened. And he was so right. Nothing like that had ever happened before. My parents still live in that house, have for 45 years. And all the years since, nothing like that has happened again. And I certainly hope it never does. I had a job most young people probably would have avoided. Back when I was just recently out of high school, I got to know the aging owners of a small funeral home in western Colorado. A floral shop had periodically sent me to deliver flowers there. Having never seen a dead person, I was trained fixed by the open casket on display in the viewing rooms. I think my reverence and curiosity led to the morticians offering me a summer job before I headed off to college. Being somewhat of a goth and a mystic, I thought it would be interesting. Little did I understand what an understatement that would be. To be completely fair to my employers, they gave me tasks completely outside of the process of embalming and presenting the deceased. For the most part, I provided help maintaining the home and grounds, really no more than an assistant or a janitor. I did assist with the loading and moving of the caskets, which was mostly mechanical, but occasionally required a bit of elbow grease. Early on, I was afraid I'd be fired because I let a casket slip off the lift. An overweight senior popped out on the marble floor, and they had to take him back to the prep room to prepare some scuffing to his face. I was mortified, but the owners told me that they doubted he felt a thing, and the next time we transported one they told me, try not to drop this one. It was fascinating to observe the family members and friends that visited the viewing rooms, and occasionally it could be heart-wrenching. I was amazed that people would bring children, even younger to me, to the home to pay their respects. One time, a young girl wandered back into the office while I was unloading some cleaning supplies. She was crying, no more than six or seven years old, and I thought maybe she'd wandered away from her family. I asked her if she was lost, or needed a bathroom. She just cried, and I told her I would help her. She ran back towards the viewing rooms, and I followed her trying to make sure she found her people, but she went into a room where no bereaved was present. I went to find her, but she wasn't there. No one was there. The only thing that was in the room was a closed child's coffin, and the hair on my scalp just rose like I touched an electric wire. I could only surmise that my eyes had been deceiving me, so I peeked into the adjacent room, where mourners were present. But none of them were children. Worried that someone would think I was losing it, I didn't mention this to my employers, but it was only the first of many things that happened to me there. As a child, 
I saw and heard spirits that gathered in my room at night. In high school, I had begun abusing alcohol and smoking pot, and it seemed like my openness to psychic phenomena had waned completely. I had only recently given up sleeping with my head under the covers, as pathetic as that sounds, but now it was all coming back. That night, I closed my eyes trying to sleep, but I could not get the image of that young girl's face out of my mind. Finally, I decided that I might as well get up and watch some TV, but when I flipped on the switch on my bed lamp, the light bulb blew out, and in the flash of the light that lasted no more than a fraction of a second, I saw the faces of at least a dozen spirits standing stationary around my bed. I was so afraid I couldn't move or even scream. Even so, I went back to my job the next day. Several years ago, my wife and I rented an upstairs apartment from one of my dad's acquaintances. The guy's elderly mother lived downstairs so he thought it would be a good idea to have some young people around to help keep an eye on her. It was a huge apartment, and we were allowed to use the attic, so we did not have to pay for a storage unit to store all of our extra stuff. The guy gave us a great discount on the rent, because we kept his mom company. We also did odd jobs for her, such as mowing the lawn and taking out her garbage. Plus, there was a convenience store, as well as a video rental store, next to the house. We lived there several months before paranormal things started to happen. It began with footsteps in the hallway outside of our bedroom. The footsteps would pace back and forth down the long hallway. They were subtle for the most part, but since we had hardwood floors, the floorboards would creak very loudly once in a while. I would rush out of the bedroom, expecting a burglar or crazy homeless person, but no one was ever there. This happened every night without fail. Eventually, we would just lay there in bed frightened out of our minds as we listened to the ghostly footsteps. After several more months, the activity took a brand new behavior. The footsteps would now stop in front of the bedroom door for several moments before resuming their pacing. My ex-wife claimed that the doorknob would occasionally squeak as if someone was trying to turn it. I never personally heard the squeaking doorknob, but there was no reason for her to make it up. Luckily, the door never did open to reveal a ghost, or an intruder for that matter. One night, I got up at around 3am to use the bathroom, when I saw a pair of translucent legs. There was nothing above the waist, walk past the bed and straight into the hall. It startled me, but I tried my best to dismiss it as a hypnotic hallucination. These are visual hallucinations that people can sometimes have when they first wake up from a deep sleep. On another night, we ended up catching several creepy voices on a digital recorder with a male voice up in the attic telling us to leave it alone. We decided to move out after two years. We were carrying out the last of our stuff, and the old lady downstairs asked if we were moving out because of the ghost. We were silent, not knowing how to respond. Then she told us that her son had gone up there to perform some sort of makeshift exorcism before we first moved in. He had gone through all of the rooms with holy water while reading Bible verses. Obviously, it did not work, but I thought it was cool because it helped validate our paranormal experiences. Months after moving out and through a bit of digging at the public library, we found out that there had once been a cemetery next to the house. In the 1850s, the townsfolk realized the cemetery had reached maximum capacity, so the graves were relocated to a more suitable site that could be expanded. Unfortunately, it was rumored that a few of the graves were left behind. More than a century later, the convenience store and video rental store were located directly on top of where the cemetery had once been. It was all reminiscent of the Poltergeist movie, with the buildings being placed on top of the graves that had been disrupted. I still wonder to this day if this ghostly activity was somehow related to the old cemetery that had once been near the house. Had the disturbed graves caused an uprest in the spirits? How can these spirits be appeased? All I know is that I sincerely wish these spirits peace.
I am a 15-year-old female sophomore living in West Virginia, USA. I've always been close to my family and friends. Maybe that's why I have this odd sixth sense sort of thing. I never really noticed I had it until just before my great uncle had passed away due to a heart attack when I was in seventh grade. Just before a loved one dies, I go through a week of extreme anxiety, and during said time frame, I also feel beyond depressed. I'd cry and freak out about almost everything. My chest and stomach would get a weird tingly feeling too, that stays in that week. When my great uncle Doodle died, I just thought my 12 year old mind was being its typical stupid self. I blame the stomach and chest stuff on my chronic Lyme disease issues I've been dealing with since I was 6. It was when his wife, my great aunt Nancy, died a few months later that I started listening to my sense. About a week prior, that feeling came back. I shrugged it off and went about my business. The last time I ever saw and talked to her was a beautiful September evening. My, someone's gonna die, alert, was going off like crazy that night. My parents, brother, and I had gone out to the store to get her a couple of groceries, since she was mostly blind and needed help with that sort of thing. We pulled into the driveway and handed her the shopping bag. She started talking away like she always did. I will never forget those last words I ever heard from her. Every time I see you, you look more like my mother. You're such a beautiful young lady, and I don't ever want you to think you're not. I know you've got a bright future ahead. I love you, baby doll. We all said our goodnights and goodbyes, and my parents drove us home. That night, I couldn't get a single bit of sleep. I tossed and turned and stared at the ceiling for hours, until I just gave up. Sleep wasn't going to happen that night. I stayed up until about 10 minutes before I was supposed to wake up, drawing in my sketchbook and listening to music. I got ready for school and walked to the bus stop across the street from my grandmother's house, which is only two streets from my house. When I got there, the atmosphere just felt really off. I looked up the hill behind me, which is where my great aunt's house was. A wave of worry hit me so hard I thought I'd be sick. I turned back around to face the road to try to ignore it. That day at school was nothing but an anxiety attack and a half. I got home that day to my mom crying. That's when I received the news of Nancy's passing. She was found in the shed that morning beneath supplies in it. I went to my room and cried until my eyes ran dry. That weird feeling went away. I had always been super close to Nancy, which is why it was her that I saw about two weeks back. That feeling is back, but I don't know who's next. I was in bed and just reached the state of finally getting into a comfortable position to sleep. I was lying on my right side, facing the wall, when I felt a part of the bed by my legs sink in like someone was sitting on it. I looked at it, but there was nothing there but a freezing cold sunken spot. Then I saw her. She was sort of transparent, with a dim golden glow around her. I looked at Nancy in awe. She looked at me with her seafoam green eyes and smiled at me. Then she faded. I began to cry until I eventually cried myself to sleep. I told my parents, but they thought I was either nuts or dreaming. That was expected, honestly. I then went to my grandmother's for breakfast before school and told her. She froze and asked, You get those feelings too? I told her that I did. She sighed and told me that a couple hours before a death, she smells roses. She smelt them very strongly the morning they found Nancy and the evening they found Doodle. I don't know what exactly it is, but it's kind of creepy. I want to know more about this, but I don't want to look like someone who's got a few screws loose upstairs. Since that feeling is back currently, I've been keeping a close watch on everyone I love. I don't know who death's next victim will be. I'm not sure I want to know. This all started about a week ago. I'm a 22-year-old guy, living in a mountainous part of the United States. I'm about 6 foot 1 and a pretty big guy. 
My girlfriend is on the other end of the spectrum. She is 20, about 5 foot 1 and thin. We honestly look like a pretty goofy couple, but we don't mind. My girlfriend and I were taking our little dog out for a walk in a park that's relatively close to my house. This particular park is mostly just woods, with trails and a baseball field and playground or two sprinkled in there. We come to this park somewhat frequently, and expected nothing more than a relaxing evening on a warm January day. Nothing has ever really happened at this park to scare me, other than the one time in high school, my friend Zach and I were exploring off trail, and saw what looked like a small dead animal and a couple pieces of clothing under one of the bridges. I assumed we probably let our imagination scare us more than anything, honestly. My girlfriend and I are walking on one of the trails at around 6.30pm, talking about what we should do once we get home, when I notice our dog staring into the woods behind us. I call out her name, but she doesn't come. I do this a few more times, but she seems locked on something beyond the trees. Figuring she's just seen a rabbit or something for the first time, I walk over to my dog and scoop her up, my plan being mainly to distract her momentarily and put her back down once we're a bit further up the trail so we can finish our walk. When I get close to her, however, I can hear she's faintly growling and whining at the same time. I follow her eyes and look into the trees to see what she's so interested in. That's when I see it for the first time. It was about 30 or 40 yards away, but I could make out a man-shaped silhouette, just standing there facing us. I stood there for a minute and struggled to make out features, any features, because it wasn't dark enough yet for me to just see the silhouette of someone. I could make out details on the trees behind it better than I could make out the human-shaped thing itself. For a moment, I wasn't sure if it was even a real person because of how long it stood completely still, until it moved its arms in a motion that wanted me to come closer to it. It was slow and non-threatening in the way it moved, and something inside me actually wanted to go towards it. It felt almost hypnotic. My girlfriend asked what was over there, which kind of snapped me out of the trance-like state I was in, and I quickly grabbed my dog and fast walked out of view of the thing standing in the woods. I glanced over at where it was standing, and it still remained unmoving, but I swear its head followed me. I told my girlfriend it was just some guy that kinda gave me the creeps, and that we should really get back to the car now. She asked what he did, and I just said he didn't really do anything, but that I had this sickening feeling in my gut that just wanted us to get away from here. I knew that the trail we were on looped back to the big parking lot, and we were halfway through it. I decided it'd be quicker to finish the trail than turn back and go the way we came, so we pushed on. My girlfriend seemed to not nearly be as worried as I was, not that I blame her I guess, and started talking about how she's excited to get home and smoke a blunt with me while we catch up on some shows on Netflix. The whole time, I'm glancing over my shoulder every 30 seconds, carrying my dog, who also seemed on edge still. At one point, when I looked over my shoulder, I saw it again. It was closer this time, maybe about 20 yards into the trees, still not moving. The thing was completely black, but it definitely was close enough to where I should have been able to see features relatively clearly, even as the sun was starting to set. I also never heard it following us, and we were going at a pretty quick pace. I should have heard twigs snapping or leaves crunching, and believe me, I listened for them but it didn't make any noise, and even managed to close the distance between us some. My dog started barking and whining, and I shouted, We have to go, as I put my hand on my girlfriend's back for her to keep up with me as we started running. She could hear I was scared, and turned around to see what I saw. She turned back around, eyes wide and face pale, and quickly passed me. It's coming, she screamed as we bolted for the parking lot at the end of the trail. This time, I could hear leaves and twigs in the woods as the thing chased us. I know this thing had to be faster than me, because I'm not exactly known for my speed, but it seemed to stay right beside me, just past the tree line as I ran. We finally made it to the parking lot, my girlfriend making it first. I threw her the keys and she started to unlock the doors as we scrambled to get inside and put the dog in the back seat. 
I backed out of our spot, and as we turned the corner to leave, I saw it rise up, like it had been running on all fours, and just watch us leave, still featureless. I had been going to that park around the woods since I was a kid, and I had never seen anything like that before, nor have I ever heard anyone mention anything like that, especially around these parts. My girlfriend doesn't want to talk about it, and my dog kinda can't in general. I don't know what I saw, but I know I'm not imagining it because I was not the only one who saw it. I doubt we'll take any more walks in that park anytime soon. If anyone has any idea what this may be, please let me know. I've had quite a few interactions with paranormal things in the past, but they were all deceased relatives of mine, grandparents and such that had passed on, so all of my experiences had actually been pleasant ones, and I always knew who they were when they visited me. But this encounter, I still cannot explain. I have no idea who or what this thing was, and that creeped the hell out of me. I was doing my homework sitting on my bed, and my dog Chase was curled up next to me on the end of the bed sleeping. Chase very suddenly picked up his head and got off the bed. He walked very slowly and robotically to my doorway and just stood there looking down the hallway towards the bathroom. I knew right away that something wasn't right because the way he was moving was just completely out of character for him. He's a beagle, so he's always been a quick moving dog that's led by his nose and his never ending search for food. I called his name softly, and he ignored me, which was also out of character. When he hears his name, he always acknowledges where it's coming from, be it with an eyebrow twitch in your direction, or a full head turned to look at you. But he did nothing. He just stood there staring, with his tail standing straight up and quivering. I was about to call out his name again, when he let out this weird howl that I'd never heard from him before. It was this unnerving one note, with no variation in it, and it made the hairs on my arms stand up. I called his name, louder this time, but he didn't respond, just kept making that horrible noise. I jumped off my bed and went over to him. I knelt down next to him and put my hands on his shoulders calling his name again. No response, so I looked in the direction that he was looking, and I wish I hadn't. Hovering right outside the bathroom door down the hall was this ball of glowing white light with what looked like a black mist or smoke flowing off of it. I've never seen anything like it in my life, and my heart dropped into my stomach. I stared at this floating thing for a while, wide-eyed, with fear and curiosity. Suddenly, the orb thing shot through the ceiling and disappeared. As soon as it was gone, Chase stopped making his haunting noise and blinked like he had just blacked out and was now just waking up. He realized my hands were on his shoulder and he turned to me, his tail starting to wag and he gave my nose a lick. It was like nothing had happened or like he had no memory of what happened and that was really scary. What was that thing he saw and what did it want with my dog? It was like Chase was being mind controlled. I was terrified that it might come back and of what else it could do. Thankfully, it never came back. I'd like to think my grandparents were still hanging around and were able to protect me from whatever that thing was, but I honestly don't know. All I know is that I'm hoping to never see that thing again. This story toes the line between otherworldly occurrences and just plain odd behavior. Back when I was 9 years old, in the late 90s, I lived in a house that was on the corner of a busy intersection in Southern California. The strange things happening started one afternoon when we were unloading groceries from the car. The sun was already setting, and the house was set up in a way that the kitchen was right next to the front door, so you could see through the kitchen window when someone was approaching the door. While my mom and I were inside putting the groceries away, and my dad was bringing some more bags in, we saw a shadow walk past the kitchen window. We couldn't see the person because the blinds were down, 
but we had clearly seen the shadow of someone. We thought it was my dad, and waited for him to come in, but no one came. Five minutes later, my dad comes in, and my mom and I ask him if he had walked in front of the window. He said that he had been out at the car since the last time we had seen him. Both my mom and I thought this was odd, but didn't think too much of it at the time. My older sister was 18 during this, and used to stay up late studying and writing papers for her college classes. She started telling my mom not long after the kitchen incident that she'd seen dark shadows in the living room while studying late one night, and that it looked like the shadow of a man. I would catch bits and pieces of their conversations about it, but since I was very young, they chose to keep me from knowing most of it. These sights became routine in the house, with my mom seeing the shadow a few times also. One afternoon, my sister called out, sounding slightly panicked, to my mom who was in her bedroom, from the kitchen, asking her if Sammy, my four-year-old sister, was with her. To which my mom replied, Yes, she's here, why? It wasn't until years later that my mom told me that my older sister had asked if Sammy was with her because she'd heard the refrigerator door open and close. There was no one around to have done this. Being the curious kid I was, I mentioned the sightings of the shadow man to my friends at school. Most of them were pleasantly creeped out by the story, but one of them mentioned that the reason behind the shadow was an accident that had taken place at the exact corner that my house was at. My friend's theory was that one of the people who had died was haunting the house. Now that I'm older, I got curious one night and decided to Google any accidents that occurred in that intersection. I found a major accident that happened there just a few years before my family moved in. Four people died and several others were injured. About two months before we moved out of the place, my mom was sitting in her room one night with the window open since it was really warm even for that hour. She looks out the window and sees a man standing in the shadows, staring right at her. My mom, being the fearless five foot nothing lady that she is, asked the man in her usual commanding voice, what are you doing here? I can see you. I'm calling the police. The man responded, go ahead, call them. I can't be caught. My mom went to get my dad, and my dad stepped outside to face the man, but there was no sign of him anywhere. He just vanished, and my dad had stepped out within a minute of this happening, and there was nowhere for him to have hidden. The shadow man made appearances until we moved out. I wasn't afraid of him, but I'm glad my family moved away from there. I used to work the night shift at a local movie theater. The theater was the first thing built on the land, and I was a member of the first crew that had worked there. It was a pretty easy job. I was a projectionist, so it was my job to make sure all the movies started on time, played through to the end no problem, and to walk the theaters at the end of the night to ensure that everyone was out. Throughout my three and a half year employment, I saw several things that I can't explain and it didn't start until I started working late, past midnight or so. Numerous times I saw a shadow in the corner of my eye, often in the shape of a man with a hat, similar to a cowboy hat. This only happened in one specific theater, nowhere else, and happened maybe once every month or so. I asked a coworker if they had ever seen it in that theater, and they said no, but they always felt like someone was watching them when they were alone in that theater. I was friends with all the managers, but one in particular would often hang out upstairs in the projection room and walk the theaters with me at the end of the night. One night as we were walking through a theater that had just ended, we turned the lights on as we were walking through the little hall that leads from the outside hall to the auditorium. We both heard laughter. Expecting to see some kids who hadn't left yet, we were startled to see that the theater was completely empty. We both walked out and called for the sheriff that was always in the theater on Friday and Saturday nights. We waited for him at the door of the theater, and when he arrived, all three of us walked back in the theater. We all looked behind the seats, behind the screen, and everywhere someone could be hiding, but didn't find anyone. It wasn't anyone out in the hallway, 
because we checked the security cameras because we were so freaked out. Another night, I was upstairs training a new projectionist on how to use the computer. We were sitting at the desk, which is around the corner from the door to get there, and we heard the door slam shut. Not like we didn't close it all the way and it fell through. It was like a solid slam. I continued talking to them, thinking that the manager would come over and wait with us for the last movie to end, but nobody ever came. After a couple minutes of talking, I got up and walked down the hall to see that there was nobody there. I asked over the radio, which was our primary communication across the theater, if they had come up, and they told me that they were waiting downstairs in the office. I told my coworker, who was completely freaked out. To paint a picture, the projection hall is a long gray room with one door in the center, and two side doors that were always closed that you can get outside from. The side doors only opened from the inside for security reasons, and there was no draft, not even a fan. In more than three years working there, not once was there any draft or moving air upstairs, and there wasn't any that night either. Only two people that night had a key, the working manager and myself. When I was 17, a group of friends and I decided we wanted to go check out the legendary Goatman Bridge on Governor's Bridge Road in Bowie, Maryland. However, I was told that it was really called Crybaby Bridge. There are many different variations of this, but what I was told when I was around 10 years old was the haunted bridge involves the story of a young 15-year-old teenage girl during the mid to late 1800s. She became pregnant and tried to keep her pregnancy hidden but her parents found out and immediately needed to get rid of it, since this was out of wedlock. The legend is that as soon as the baby popped out of the womb, her parents ran off with the baby and threw it off the bridge, obviously killing it, most likely drowning it in the fast flowing water. The girl begged to know where they put her baby. The mother told her devastated daughter that they threw her baby off the bridge. Now boiling with sorrow and anger, she bolts to the bridge. She desperately keeps trying to find her baby, even frantically crossing up and down looking in the water. No luck. Overcome with sadness, she jumps off the bridge to her death. Crybaby Bridge is forever haunted by the girl frantically looking for her baby. She hears the baby crying, but she never finds it. Now this is where the fun happens. The urban legend rules were to first cut off the car lights, get out, stand in front of the bridge, and shout, I have your baby. What's supposed to happen is first you'll hear the faint sound of a baby crying, then your car lights and engine will suddenly turn on, and the doors will lock. As soon as you head back for the wheel, she will appear, first softly speaking and crying, and gradually screaming, Where is my baby? Nothing happened. Although I did feel a bit strange, I figured it was in my head. However, I did one thing a bit different than the routine, which I've now learned to never do again. Being the asshole I was, I said, I have your baby you stupid bitch, come and get it. Yes, disrespectful, but I thought it might achieve more attention from the ghost. Now this is where it gets creepy. When I get home, I go downstairs to do more research on the bridge. I've only been home a couple of minutes when I hear a loud crash upstairs. Thinking it's my grandpa, who would occasionally drop something off his bed, or even fall, I rush upstairs to his aid. I run down the hallway and reach my grandpa's room. He was sound asleep. Then I realized that while I was running down the hall, something wasn't right. As I'm walking back, I see three framed pictures off both walls were shattered. Every single picture was of me as a baby, not even being one year old. I put two and two together and thought this ghost had followed me home, and I really pissed her off. I thought this had to be a coincidence, but it was too random. Those pictures have no reason to fall off the wall like that. I pick one broken picture up and notice my dog acting strange. 
She was staring at the front door, and she wouldn't budge. I was calling her, offering treats, and even tried to move her, but she wouldn't budge. This bugged me out, because she always listened to me, and who can't resist a treat? I do believe animals can see things we can't. I was starting to get really nervous, but kept my composure and remembered my dad telling me a story about a ghost. This was the quick story I mentioned earlier. When he was 18, he bought his first apartment. It was extremely cheap. Too cheap, because the last two tenants claimed it was haunted and wanted out. Apparently a woman was stabbed to death in the apartment eight months earlier, and now she was haunting the apartment. My old man couldn't give a shit. It was cheap, and he didn't believe in that stuff. This changed. He said that every night around 12.45 a.m., he would hear what sounded like footsteps starting from his hallway and ending at his bed. He's a mechanical dude, so he thought it had to be a timed machine within the walls. However, after a week, it clearly sounded like footsteps. So one night, when he heard the last step at the foot of his bed, he announced, Look, I'm sorry, but I live here now. I don't mind that you're here either but please stop making noise. It's scaring me. And just like that, it stopped. So I decided to do the same thing. While holding the broken frame, I apologized out loud. I'm sorry for saying those mean things. I don't have your baby. I won't do it ever again. My dog then clawed the door. I opened it and closed it. I didn't have a sense of presence anymore. I felt like I had dodged a bullet. After that experience, I did research and found out that if ghosts are angry enough, they can attach themselves to you. Then again, this all could have been coincidence. But what I learned is to not disrespect the paranormal. I'll start off by saying that this happened in Texas. I'm a girl, six foot tall and strong as an ox, and I'm 25 now, but at the time this happened I was 21. One night I was hanging out with a few friends, and my then girlfriend, Shay, and we were sitting in an IHOP after a big nerd fest with a bunch of other people. During this particular night, my friend Britt told us about this supposedly haunted area near us called Goatman's Bridge. Shay and I had never heard of this, and being big paranormal buffs, we were intrigued. Britt told us that supposedly some years back, an African American man had lived out past the bridge, and had done fairly well for himself, and gained the name The Goatman. This was a long time ago though, and the Klansman became angry when he started displaying a sign that read simply, This way to the Goatman's. They took him one night, and hung him over the bridge, but when they looked down to where he should have been, the noose was empty. Panicked, they ran back to his home and slaughtered his family. I'll post a link in the description to the full story where you can read up on it for yourself, but that much information is all that we got before deciding to tempt fate and go. We arrived there about an hour later, and it was pitch black outside. You used to be able to drive across the bridge, but it's been closed down for some time, so we crossed the barricade and walked over to the bridge. It was me, Shay, Britt, and my good friend Michael, and another girl that I didn't really know too well, but we'll call her Misty. Michael, Shay, and I have always been very in touch with all things paranormal. We've always been able to sense things, so we decided before crossing the bridge to have a look around, he and I would be in front, shielding our friends, should something bad go down. I wanted Shay behind me, because I wouldn't have her getting hurt. We got in formation, and began to walk. Shay stayed right behind me, tightly clutching my shirt in her hand to make sure that she didn't get too far away from me, and Britt and Misty brought up the rear. I kept murmuring things to Michael, keeping my eyes on the woods around us, asking him if he felt how heavy the air seemed. He told me yes, but we kept going, slowly. 
we decided quietly that if it got much worse, we would go back. A bit further up, Shay suddenly gasped hard and pressed up against me. I asked her what was wrong, and we stopped walking while I made sure that she was okay. She told me she'd heard a loud growl, and when she turned to look, she saw something that she thought might be an animal, but it was wrong. It was wrong, she said. I asked if she wanted to go back, but she shook her head and took my shirt again, and we continued. Maybe five minutes passed, and the air was so thick that it was almost hard to breathe. Michael took my hand, and we looked around, and I swear to you, I saw figures in the dark. As dark as it was out in those woods, these were somehow darker, and there were many. We weren't alone out there. I shared a glance with Michael, and at the same time we both whispered, We need to go. Now. We turned to our friends and told them that this was as far as we'd go, and we needed to get back to the car immediately. They didn't argue, and we stayed at the rear of the party, hoping to keep those shadows away from our friends. When we got back to the bridge, we stood there for a moment to catch our breath, and it sounded almost like there was something in the water below us, sloshing around noisily. I tried to ignore it, deciding it must be an animal, and not to mention I suddenly had a headache from hell. Shay curled up to me and asked if I was okay, and I just told her that I wanted to go home. All I wanted to do was get away from that bridge. As we walked back to the car, I asked Britt to unlock it, and she obliged. The thing with Britt's car is that when she unlocks it, the light inside comes on and then slowly turns off after you get in. I placed my hand on the handle right after I heard it click unlock, and it clicked again as I pulled it, and the light shut off immediately. I blinked, looking up at her. I asked, Did you lock it? And her eyes were wide as she said, No, and that light isn't supposed to do that. That was the last straw. She unlocked the door again and we got in and hightailed it home. If I weren't a moron, that would have been the end of the story. But unfortunately, I'm a moron. Maybe six months later, I, Shay, Britt, Michael, and one of our other friends, who I'll just call Jay, were sitting at a Taco Bell having a late dinner. We mentioned something about the bridge, and Jay asked what all the talk was about. We told her all that had happened, and said that it wasn't an experiment that we wanted to repeat. She's a skeptic, and she wanted to go see what we were all so spooked about. When I told her no, she threw a tantrum, said she wanted to go and she wouldn't have it any other way. I liked this Taco Bell, and I liked the people in it, and when they started staring because my friend was throwing a fit, I told her irritably to shut the hell up and we'd go, as long as we could go and get batteries for the flashlight that was in Britt's car. Britt agreed and I could tell Shay and Michael weren't happy to be doing this again, but they shared my irritation with Jay and understood why I agreed. Fast forward a bit, and we were out at the bridge again, this time armed with a flashlight and a skeptical friend that loved to irritate me. We got to the middle of the bridge, and Shay said that she didn't want to go. Understandable. So I squeezed her hand and kissed her, and told her to stay here and that we'd be back. Britt offered to stay with her, and so Michael and I told Jay that we were going to be in front and that she was going to stay behind us at all times. I asked her to please just listen to what we said and not argue, and informed her that spirits and things like that fed off of negativity, and arguing would only create negativity. She agreed to stay behind us, and we started to walk into the woods once again. I held the flashlight tight in one hand, and I had literally just replaced the batteries five minutes ago, so I figured we would be okay with this little bit of light it offered. As soon as we stepped into the trees though, that same heaviness from the first trip was immediate, and the light died almost instantly. I hit it against my hand a few times, thinking no way, this can't actually have just happened. And when I couldn't get it to work again, I pocketed the damn thing and looked to Michael. We shouldn't go any further and he agreed. But Jay, oh Jay, she wanted to go further. 
She saw nothing wrong with the flashlight dying, and just thought it was a coincidence. I shouldn't have let her change my mind, but I did. We walked just a bit further into the darkness, and then Michael stopped and grabbed my hand. No, we have to go back. We can't be here anymore. And I knew he was right. I turned to Jay and told her to turn around and march her little butt back to Britain Shay. She argued, and it took me using a voice that I can only deem as a mom voice to make her shut up and go back. We were back in a matter of minutes, and I went to Shay and hugged her, wanting some comfort. We told them about the flashlight, and Britt sort of laughed it off, and Jay still wanting to go out further. We told her that she could go if she wanted to, but we were done. Needless to say, she didn't go. Michael hopped up on the railing of the bridge and stood there looking out at the sky, and after a moment, I stood up there with him. We were silent for a minute, before he suddenly lurched forward, making an uh, noise when he hit the side of the bridge. I grabbed his shirt and pulled him back, and asked him what the hell he was doing. He looked terrified. Something just pushed me, he said, and I frowned and turned to Britt saying, Let's go. Shay suddenly called my name, and I turned to her, sensing her distress. She looked up at me and asked me to look at her back because she felt like she'd been bitten by a bug or something. When I took a look, I saw three long red welts on her back, and when I touched them, she flinched. I asked her if she had scratched herself, and her eyes got wide as she said no. That was enough. I was done with this, and I grabbed Shay by the hand and started walking back to the car, saying that we needed to go home. They didn't argue, and followed suit. The car didn't do anything weird this time, and we piled in and headed home. We didn't even get a mile away before there was a loud bang, and Britt's car started swerving. There were shrieks, and Britt managed to pull off to the side of the road and park, as I asked if everyone was okay. They were all fine, so we exited the car to find out what the hell had happened. One of Britt's back tires had blown, but we hadn't hit a hole, and none of us knew how to change a tire. We started looking around for what could have caused this, like if we'd run over something. There was nothing, just a field to the right and left of us, and absolutely nothing on the road. While trying to figure out what to do, Michael said that his roommate knew how to change a tire, and he could call him to come and get us out. So he did, and we sat and waited. He got off the phone and told us that it would be a little while, but his roommate was coming, and that we would be okay. We all attempted to relax, but how could we? It was dark, and we had just nearly wrecked after being at a creepy place like Goatman's Bridge. Tensions were a little high. About 20 minutes had passed of me texting a friend what we had just done, and telling her that we were idiots, and that we should have known better than to go back out there again. It was out of love. I know, and I laughed and told her she was right. About this time, I glanced over and noticed Michael had started walking. Not towards us, but back towards the bridge. I ran after him and asked him what he was up to. He said nothing was wrong, but he just wanted to walk. I frowned and said nothing, but told him after a minute I would go with him. He didn't agree or disagree, so I took that as an okay. We got to a curve in the road and I heard Shay screaming at us to stop. I stopped, grabbed his wrist, and made him stop, and turned back to look at her, as a car pulled around the corner going very fast, and passed by us. If we had gone much further, he may not have seen us and we could have been hit. I shook his wrist and said that we should go back to the car, and he almost sleepily said okay as we walked back. Shay told me not to leave again, and hugged me tight, and I felt bad for scaring her and told her that I was sorry. Michael stood out in the ditch now, just staring at something I couldn't see out in the distance. Walking over to him, I asked him what was up, and if he was okay, and he looked at me, and I realized he was crying. Worried, I took him into my arms and asked him what was wrong, and he gripped my back tightly and shook, 
his tears wetting my shoulder. I'm terrified of drowning. Something wanted to push me into that water. Something wanted me to drown. He paused and shivered. I just rubbed his back, listening, petting his hair occasionally, and he spoke again. I could hear voices. They told me my friends wouldn't care. They said, they said... His voice broke, and I shushed him softly, still petting his hair while he cried. I told him that the voices were full of shit. I told him we all loved him and that he was alright, and that everything was going to be okay. After a few minutes of this, he pulled away from me and rubbed his face, and tried to laugh it off, saying he was fine and thanking me. But I could tell he wasn't. He just wanted to be tough, so I let him be, and he went and sat in the car. After another 30 minutes or so, his roommate finally showed up, and it was an almost tangible collection sigh of relief from all of us. We really just wanted to go home, because it had gotten super late, and we were all exhausted, mentally and physically. His roommate pulled the tire off after a bit, and laid it on the ground so we could all finally see what had happened. There was a fist-sized hole on the inside of the tire. It looked like someone, or something, had reached into the rubber and pulled out a huge chunk. There were even finger-shaped marks like when a fist is shaped. This creeped us all out, even Jay, who despite everything was still skeptical. She couldn't find an explanation as to why this happened, or why it so closely resembled a hand. When the tire was replaced, we finally got back on the road and headed home, and luckily no other car trouble happened. However, on the way while we were all nervously laughing and making jokes, saying we hoped nothing else would happen, I heard Michael speak. His voice was almost too quiet, and sounded like a small girl's voice. I almost didn't hear him because I was in the front seat and he was in the back, but he very softly said, Skin feels weird, doesn't it? And then he laughed quietly, childlike, and my hair stood up on end. Whoever was sitting next to my girlfriend and my friend was not Michael, and I clenched my fist silently, vowing silently that if whatever it was did anything sideways, I would knock it right back to where the hell it came from. When we pulled up and parked by mine and Shay's apartment, I got out of the car fast and turned to the back door opening it and hauling Michael out by his shirt. He glared at me, and boy if looks could kill. Let go of me, he said, his deep voice again, but his eyes didn't know me. He looked like a stranger, and I shook him, quietly saying, Michael, it's me. Let go of me, he said again, this time angrier, and I pulled him into a hug, repeating over and over, it's me, you're okay, come back. He pushed against my chest for a moment, almost like he was trying to get away, before he paused and I could hear him say my name. I looked at him, and he stared at me, confused. He was himself again, I could tell. I asked if he was okay, and if he knew what had just happened, and he told me no, and asked me what was wrong. I told him what he had said in the car, and his expression sunk. He took a moment to process my words before telling me he wanted to sit down for a little while, asking if he could come upstairs with Shay and I. I told him yes, and Britt and Jay went home as we went upstairs. We sat with him for a good bit, making sure he was okay. He was laughing by the end of everything, saying, Great, now I'm the freak that thinks skin feels weird, and joking about it all. I think he was still very uneasy about the whole situation, but he was trying not to let it get to him. I can't say I blame him. I live alone now, and I'm still great friends with Shay, and I talk to Michael sometimes. But when Goatman's Bridge gets brought up, it's always a, haha, we were so dumb, let's never do that again, type of thing. I've thought about going back, but I honestly don't know if I ever will. I'm too afraid of what might happen, and every time I think about it, the phrase, third time's a charm, pops into my head. 
I have to remind myself often that going twice enough was a mistake, and it's lucky that my friends and I got away, unscathed. If you were ever in Texas, and you decide that it would be a good idea to go to Goatman's Bridge, please, just be careful. Listen to your instincts, and if your instincts say to run, run. I'm odd when it comes to paranormal things in life. I topple between believing in it and not believing in it. I guess it's more like I don't want to believe in it. For as long as I can remember, I have always been afraid of mirrors and dark windows. Nothing ever happened, but for some reason I just never liked to go near them, so I always tended to avoid them. The house I used to live in with my parents was claimed to be haunted. They still live there but I have since moved out. It was an old hospital back in the 1800s. It's not very big hospital standard-wise, but for a house it was rather large. My bedroom was on the third floor of the house. It was like a small apartment. I had my main bedroom, a living room, bathroom, and a room that we called the glass ceiling room because the ceiling was made of glass. When we first moved into that house, I claimed a much smaller room on the second floor, and I was always afraid to go up on the third floor, especially alone. What drove me to want to move up there, I still don't know, but it wasn't so bad after I moved all my things up. The first few nights I slept on the third floor, things were okay, nothing unusual, but after maybe a week or so, I started noticing odd occurrences. The door to my bedroom was loose, and every night around the same time, which was roughly between 1 and 2 a.m., my door would slowly creak open. Not a lot, but just enough to make that eerie sound before it would slam back shut. This woke me up constantly. I thought at first it was just the air conditioner, as the vents were on the ceiling rather than the floor. But this occurred even when there was no air. Still, I assumed it was just because the house was old. The glass ceiling room was always kept shut. I didn't like it, my friends didn't like it. During the day it was a gorgeous room, with sunny walls and bright light illuminating the area, but at night it seemed to take an all new demeanor. Several of my friends would make comments about seeing shadows in that room, or hearing whispers. I would tell them that the shadows were caused by streetlights outside, and the whispers were probably just my neighbors, as their house was extremely close to mine. I always seemed to have an explanation that I thought was logical. However, I still have no explanation as to how this event happened. I had a friend over one night. Her name was Logan. The two of us would always like to goof around with scary things, telling each other stories and reading others online. We decided to play hide and seek in the dark room with my younger brother. When it came time for me to be it, I went into my brother's room to start counting. I found my brother fairly quickly but Logan was hopping from place to place, making it harder to find her. I was just about to give up and admit defeat when I hear the most intense scream I had ever heard from her before. It was coming from the third floor. I rushed towards the stairs, but she was already racing down them, so fast that she slammed into me. Through her sobbing and hyperventilating, I got her to tell me what had happened. Apparently, Logan decided to go upstairs and hide in the glass ceiling room as her final hiding spot. While she was standing behind the door listening for me, she claimed she heard someone whispering her name behind her. When she turned around, obviously no one was there. What happened next still chills me. She said that as she turned back to the door, she felt someone grab a handful of her hair and yank it so hard her head was jerked back. Logan was never one to lie and she definitely wasn't a good actor, so I knew that something must have happened to her to get her this worked up. We ended up sleeping downstairs in the living room that night, and Logan never came back to my house after that. Fast forward a few years, and I'm sitting on the couch in my living room upstairs. I was watching a movie when all of a sudden I felt compelled to look towards the window just across from my couch. It had a little window seat that my grandmother made a small cushion for, so I could sit there and read. I had a really odd feeling, 
like someone was sitting in the window nook staring at me. I decided to go downstairs and walk the dogs with my dad. I had almost forgotten about the creepy feelings until we returned home. As soon as we walked up the driveway, I shot a glance up at the third story window where my reading nook was, and there, staring back down at me was the pale face of what looked like an elderly lady. My blood ran cold. I wanted to ask my dad if he saw her too, but I was too scared to say anything, and I knew he was not a believer in the paranormal, at all. I ended up sleeping downstairs once more. Not long after that event, I was home alone with my three dogs. We were all laying in the living room, me on the floor watching TV. My eldest dog, Chip, who also happened to be the sweetest dog in the world, suddenly leapt up from the chair and began to bark and growl at the ceiling above him. Some background on Chip. He has since passed away since this incident. He was suffering from stomach cancer, which is why I was surprised when he found the energy to jump around barking and growling. He also never barked and growled, so this also startled me. Chip was a good-sized dog, and in his prime he was a tank. He was part Doberman mixed with Golden Retriever, with the sweetest temperament ever. The hairs on the back of his neck were raised, and he was snarling so viciously I was slightly afraid to go near him. His actions caused my other two dogs, a husky and a chug, to join in. They eventually moved from the chair to the front of the stairs that led up to the second floor. Chip climbed halfway up the stairs with ease, which again was odd since he was so old and ill. He stopped, and his eyes locked at the top of the stairs as he continued to snarl and bark. I followed him, and that was the first time I actually saw a shadow-like figure flee from sight. I called my parents and told them what was happening. They were more concerned about Chip, as they didn't want him overworking himself, but as I knew they would, they told me it was nothing. I began to have vivid night terrors after that. Dreams of monstrous shadows looming over me, taking me by the hand and leading me off into a shadowy forest. I would wake up drenched in sweat and unable to move. Along my walls, Shadows would dance and slither towards me. I would just shut my eyes and pray for them to go away. As the days went on, my dreams would get worse. Eventually they became so vivid I had to talk to a counselor, as they were starting to be about my loved ones dying in horrible ways. One dream in particular I can recall was that of my boyfriend. He has an old sports car that he likes to drive and be reckless in. The dream started off with me in an arena-like setting, one you would go watch motorbike races in or something. A boy I went to school with, but never really talked to, raced by me in his car and wrecked it. I remember I rushed towards him to see if he was okay, but his head was missing and his body was crushed. Then more and more people I went to school with, but never talked to, began to die in horrible ways around me. I was panicking. I didn't know what to do or how to get out of this arena. Soon the people dying were the ones closer to me. Best friends, family members. But the death I remember most vividly was that of my boyfriend, Luke. He raced past me in his old sporty car. He had a smile on his face and he blew me a kiss as he rushed by. I remember screaming for him to stop, but my voice just wouldn't come out. Like everyone before him, Luke wrecked his car, only his burst into flames. I frantically dug him out. The smell of burnt flesh filled my nostrils. I could actually smell his skin burning in my dream. I pulled him from the rubble and held him in my arms. His head was bent sideways, and the bones from his spine were sticking out. One of his eyes were missing, leaving a dark, empty socket staring at me. Blood was spurting from his mouth and nose, and he was making a gurgling noise. What was creepiest of all about this dream was that as he lay there, dying in my arms, he still had a smile on his face. That dream was the last straw for me. I ended up getting a job as soon as I was old enough so I could save up money and move out. The last thing that happened to me before I moved out was actually not in the house at all. I had left for work at around 2. It was a bright summer day which is why this seemed odd to me. 
My work was about 30 minutes away in a town called Easton. I take a lot of back roads to get there, including one that goes by my old high school. Down one back road is a dump where people drop off their trash. I can recall driving past the dump and looking out my rearview mirror, and something was running after my car. I assumed it was a jogger, as they are not an uncommon sight around where I live. But something was different about this figure. It was definitely masculine, I could tell by its physique. However, it was almost keeping up with the speed of my car. I glanced at my speedometer, just to make sure I wasn't driving slow. I was going almost 50 miles an hour, and this thing was practically right behind me, running on two legs. It was then that I noticed it had no features, no face, no clothing lines, nothing. It was just a black figure, almost transparent. I stopped at the stop sign just up the road a little ways, though I was reluctant to. But when I glanced back at the figure, it had just stopped and was standing there at the top of the hill, staring at me. I peeled away as quickly as I could and decided not to tell anyone of this event. On my way home that night, I took the long way back, even though I was dangerously curious to see if it would chase me again. My boyfriend and I have since moved out on our own, and no longer live with our parents. We moved into an old apartment complex that was made out of an old church, and I haven't had any strange occurrences since then. My night terrors have stopped, and I haven't seen any more shadowy figures. I still visit my parents often, as they only live about 15 minutes away. My little brother has decided to take over the third floor now, and so far I haven't heard any stories from him. But then again, I never asked. This is a short story, but probably one of the creepiest things that has ever happened to me and my most vivid childhood memory. I was very young at the time, probably no older than six or seven. Myself, my mom, brother, and older sister all lived in a house together in a neighborhood called Oak Hill. Our house was right next to a cemetery. One of those small, neat-looking veteran cemeteries. I never thought much of it. It didn't really creep me out or anything, but I was a good kid, and out of respect, I mostly avoided it. One night I was sleeping on the couch with my mom. My brother, who was roughly the same age as me, was sleeping on the love seat next to us, and my sister, who was in her late teens at the time, was sleeping in her room. My mother and I suddenly awoke to the sound of a loud, horrible pounding on the back door, which was in the kitchen in the next room over. This wasn't any normal pounding, like if you were to beat on someone's door with your fist. It literally sounded like whoever it was was using a sledge to break through the door. My brother was already awake, and sitting in the corner in a fetal position crying and rocking. Frantic, my mother and I stumbled to our feet. Tears were already welling in my eyes. I was terrified. All I wanted to do was bolt through the front door and into the car, but we had to get my sister. In order to do this, we would have to walk right past the kitchen and move down the hall to her room. My mother didn't want to leave my brother and I alone in the living room, so we huddled together and began to crawl moving slowly towards the hallway. Thinking back, I don't think we were crawling for any reason other than sheer terror, as we still would have been clearly visible to whoever was trying to get in. We had one of those back doors with skewed windows on it, and the door faced the very hallway that we were trying to crawl through. So anyway, crawling, we approached the opening along the wall that divides the living room, kitchen, and the hallway leading to my sister's room. At this point, we could hear glass shattering and raining onto the ground clear as day. Slowly, my mom and I began to peer around the corner to look into the kitchen, expecting to see glass everywhere and someone climbing through the window on the door. The kitchen was to our left and the hall was to our right. Amazingly though, there was nothing. No glass. The door still intact. And if there was someone out there, we couldn't see them. Still though, every one or two seconds there was that pounding, 
and now we knew for certain that it was definitely coming from the door. After probably a moment or two of hesitation, we hurriedly crawled down the hall to my sister's room. As soon as we were in, my mom sat her up and said, We have to leave. Someone's trying to break in. We rushed back down the hallway, into the living room, and straight out of the front door into the car. This time, not stopping to see if whoever was out there had gotten in. But I remember, for the briefest second as we passed, seeing a figure standing in the middle of our kitchen watching us, out of my peripheral. We drove to a gas station, which was probably a mile down the road, to use the payphone. This was in the early 90s, so no one had cell phones yet. My mom called the cops. They came, and we followed them back to our house. After they went and checked everything out, they came and got us all, and told us that they didn't find anyone. We walked around the yard, the officer shining his flashlight around searching the ground for any signs of anyone, and the kitchen door. I was expecting the door to be broken, and to find glass all over the place, but there was still nothing. The back door, nor the window, had been touched. The back door was still even locked. There was no broken glass, no sign of any damage to the house, no sign that anyone had been on or around the property. Nothing. To this day, I still can't explain what happened that night. None of us can. We all heard the same thing. All of us could have swore that at any moment, someone would be coming through the kitchen door. Or at the very least, someone was destroying something on our property. Yet it was as if it was a part of our imagination. We lived in a bungalow type house together with my parents and my older brother. It's a nice house with enough space for the four of us, and it's located in a quiet neighborhood. Yet, something seems odd in our lovely house. One time, my brother asked me how quickly I got to my room. It was an odd question, so I asked him what he meant. He said that we passed by one another at the front door, as if I was just about to head outside. I apparently, nodded in acknowledgement as he greeted me. But I was inside my room the whole time, studying for an exam. At another time, around 8 in the morning, my mother was furiously knocking on the bathroom door for my brother. How long are you going to be in there? She asked. I'm late for work. I asked what was happening, and my mom told me that my brother went in the shower about an hour ago. Just then, my brother came out of his room with messy hair and just in his boxers. What's going on? He asked. Clearly, my brother had just woken up. My mom and I looked at each other with confusion. After ten seconds, she snapped out of it and reached for the doorknob. It was locked. My mom then headed back to their room for the key to the bathroom. I can clearly hear the sound of water inside. My brother walked to my side and I quickly filled him in on what was happening. Are you sure it's not dad in there? I asked jokingly. Your father already left for work. She groans as she started to open the bathroom door. He wanted to get some paperwork done as it was starting to pile. All three of us huddled in front of the door as it opens. There was no one inside, but the shower is still running. This gave us all the creeps, but I am not convinced. After that, these events happened occasionally. My mom sees dad in another part of the house, only to turn up somewhere else. Dad sees my brother jogging outside, yet he's slacking inside the house. The works. I, personally, haven't witnessed it for myself. Until one time. My brother and I are about to head out one afternoon. I'm about to head out and buy something, and my brother is going to this party. My parents were at work, so no one was around. My brother kept asking me all day to go with him. I don't like the company of his friends, so I refused. Maybe I should take your doppelganger with me, he jokingly said. I laughed at his brilliant idea. Well, I thought it was brilliant at the time. I headed towards the kitchen to grab a mug. I placed the mug on top of the dining table and said in the creepiest voice I could muster, 
If there's something in this house, you will move this mug for me. My brother then made this, ooh, sound, then laughed. We then prepared to leave. I checked around the house before leaving. Everything's locked, no stoves on, no unnecessary electronics on, etc. The only weird thing was the empty mug on the table I left. We then headed to the bus stop. Along the way we had small talk, but he manages to slip in the occasional, you sure you don't want to go? question. Arriving at my stop, he gave one final attempt. Are you sure you don't want to go? Finally fed up, I said, I'll think about it, then left the bus. I went to the store and got what I wanted. It was a newly released video game, by the way. Not wanting to go home immediately, I hung out at the coffee shop for a while. After a couple of hours, I got tired of browsing the internet using my phone and headed for home. I arrived home at 9 p.m. As I headed for the front door, I'm surprised to see our living room lights on. I knocked, and my brother opened the front door. Confused, I asked, what happened to the party? It didn't turn out to be what I expected, he begrudgingly said. I got bored and left. He then proceeded to sit on the couch and turn the TV on. I sighed, then headed to my room. I passed by our dining room table and noticed the mug I placed earlier. I chuckled as I reached for the mug and turned my head towards my brother. See, there's no such thing as go- I stopped. The mug was warm. I didn't know why, but I was immediately overwhelmed with fear. I quickly turned back to the mug and saw it filled with coffee. I turned my head towards the living room and see the back of my brother's head, still watching TV. I was about to ask him if he filled the mug when my cell phone rang. Still looking towards the living room, I answered the phone. Bro, you're not gonna believe this. Your crush is here. I told you you should have come. It was my brother's voice. I briskly walked towards my room without looking back and quickly locked myself inside. But I thought you got bored and went home, I asked. What are you talking about? Anyway, you can still catch her if you come. My brother said that then hung up. I never went out of my room until the next morning. I told my parents and my brother what happened, and even during the time telling my experience, I didn't trust any of them fully, but was eventually convinced that it was my real parents, and specifically my real brother. After a short while, my parents placed the house on the market and then moved out. During college, I'm living inside a four-story all-girls dormitory, it was basically an apartment type building with small rooms big enough to place two beds and two desks. On both sides of each floors, there are bathrooms. Public type bathrooms with two rows of cubicles, one for showers and one for toilets. Our room was on the fourth floor. My roommate and I were basically best friends. We met during our freshman year, formed a close bond even though we have very different courses and were never really classmates and now on our graduating year. My best friend slash roommate, Lori, was a devout Catholic. She would pray the rosemary every night before going to bed. I really didn't mind since it didn't bother me, and I'm Catholic myself, but don't practice much religion anymore. Anyway, back to the dormitory. Some of our neighbors from the third floor complained to management because a lot of people from the second floor frequently use their bathrooms during the morning to shower. Morning showers suck in our dorm, since we share common bathrooms. Lines will be formed during the early morning rush. Second floor people defend themselves by saying that they didn't want to use their bathrooms because it was haunted. Let's call this bathroom 2B for the story. 2A was fine, but can't accommodate everyone on the second floor. 2B as the rumors say, houses a ghost of a lady who hung herself because of the pressures of schoolwork. Second floor people claim to see the ghost, hear laughter or cries while showering alone, feel cold spots and touches here and there, but the most common claim was that everyone felt an evil presence inside the room. 
fast forward to the final months of graduating year. After the final exams, everyone just wanted to party to relieve the pressure from our tired selves. Lori and I went to this party and hung out with the rest of our common friends. Everyone was drinking heavily. I had a moderate about myself. Lori can't handle much alcohol, so she drank a little. We had a blast, partying and dancing all night. It was about 4 a.m. when Lori and I decided to head back to our dormitory. We said our goodbyes, then headed out. We walked towards the dormitory, since it was just a few blocks from the party we went to. Halfway there, Lori needs to go pee. I jokingly told her to do it in the bushes. She laughed sarcastically as a reply. We walked faster, and eventually got to our dorm, passed by our security, then headed up the stairs towards the fourth floor. As we were passing the bathroom, she immediately rushed inside. I really need to go. I can't hold it anymore, she said. You'll never guess which bathroom she went in. Yup, 2B. I really didn't know what to do. Yeah, I'm scared for her, solely basing my fears on the stories I've heard. I waited outside the bathroom for her. I heard her say something from the inside. Lori, are you okay? I whisper into the bathroom as I peek. I really can't see the cubicles since the wall is blocking the way. After a few seconds, she ran out of the bathroom. I could see her jeans wet. She grabbed me by the arm and headed up for our room. Her hand was cold and clammy. She was pale, and I could clearly see tears in her eyes. When we arrived in our room, she was in a panic. She knelt at the side of her bed and started to mumble prayers. I didn't know what to say at this point. After she calmed down, and after Lori cleaned herself up in the shower, with me accompanying her this time, she told me what she saw. When she entered the bathroom, she saw something at the other end. Just a dark figure. The light was on, but there was still this dark thing. She felt that it was looking directly at her, staring down to her very soul. She closed her eyes and started to pray out loud. Hail Mary, full of grace. Midway through her prayer, she opened her eyes, and the thing was gone. But then she heard someone mumbling from above her. She looked up and saw the figure inches away from her face. It was saying something to her. Hail Mary, Hail Mary, Hail Mary. I really can't explain what happened. Lori would never lie to me about anything, and for the whole time we lived in the dorm we just never pranked each other. I can still remember how pale she was, and how cold her hands were. We still keep in touch with one another to this day, and are still close friends, but we never talk about that day again. I was about six years old when my grandmother was diagnosed with having lung cancer. So, we drove from Texas all the way to Villisca, Iowa. Yes, this happens to be the same place the axe murders took place, but this story has nothing to do with it. So my parents and I drove to the outskirts of Villisca, where my aunt lives. It was a huge two-story house that was built a long time ago. It looked like your typical old house. Old-fashioned decals, balconies, white trim, and topped off with an old chicken coop in the back. I was really young back then, and it was my first and last time there, so I'm sorry if I forget some details. Basically, when I arrived at the house, I immediately ran to find my 16-year-old epic cousin who we'll call Lyra for privacy reasons. She was awesome, and we pretty much played Pokemon all day together, and try to ease ourselves into the fact that our grandmother was dying. But anyway, here was six-year-old little me having the time of my life playing with my cousin's copy of Crystal and being the noob that I am. But, while I was in the middle of a gym battle, I had this overwhelming feeling of excitement. And then I just had this idea to go upstairs into one of the guest bedrooms. In that bedroom, there was a collectible old-fashioned toy car collection that I found myself staring at. 
I could never really understand why, but the one thing that really stood out to me was the one red car. I think it was a little buggy or something. I picked it up, and I immediately felt sick. I actually ran into the bathroom because I thought I was going to throw up, which I did. I'll spare you the gross details, but when I finally left I saw one of the cats of the house, Princess, sitting near the stairs. What happened next still sticks to me and makes me feel guilty to this day. My movements were not my own, but I remember running over to the young cat and picking it up and forcefully throwing it down the stairs. I wasn't thinking anything in that moment, but I knew it was wrong, but it was like my body had a mind of its own. After that, I kinda snapped out of this violent state, and if you're wondering, the cat is totally fine, no broken bones. I ran downstairs and went back to playing my game, but I felt so sick and guilty that I started crying at one point. Then, an old lady came behind me. I remember that she looked totally normal and looked so nice. She said no words, but I felt comfortable and safe. At some point, she left the room. We had a lot of family in that large house come and visit, so it was up to my guess who it was. I saw her around the house, sitting among family members, walking around the house. She even looked at others when they were talking in conversations. She never spoke, however. Weeks pass on, and slowly people start to leave. Soon, all that's left is my aunt, my two cousins, uncle, and a friend of my aunt, along with me and my parents. On the same night that almost everyone left, the woman came by again. I thought she was another friend of my aunt, so I said, Hello. No reply. But she looked completely fine. Not angry, not sad, relatively no emotion. But she still had a smile, if that makes any sense. I really did just shrug it off and continue to play my Pokemon game. Soon, my parents and I had to leave. We said our goodbyes, got in the car, and my mom turned to me and asked me some questions. I don't really remember this part, but this is what my parents claim. My mom, being corny and all with a six-year-old, asks, Did you say goodbye to Aunt Jane? I nodded. Did you say goodbye to your uncle? Nodded again. Did you say goodbye to your cousins? I nodded again. After a while, I ask, But mom, what about the old lady? She looks at me. What old lady? I'm getting a bit agitated at this point. How could you forget the nice old lady that always sat next to you? I think she liked you. It's mean to ignore people. Turns out there was no old person at the house. The only old person was my grandmother, but she was in the hospital and bared no resemblance. My mom said she would never take me to that house again, and we never did go back. My aunt even sold the house and now lives down the street from the axe murder house. Quite a funny coincidence, but nothing strange has ever happened, and I never saw the strange old lady ever again. But recently, while sitting and watching TV, I had what I suppose you would call a revelation of sorts. I remember that in the same room with the cars, I saw an old lady standing outside on the balcony. I remember what she looked like again. Old gray hair tied in a bun, some old tattered pink dress, and brown shoes. Before, I could only recall her face. It was an old house, so naturally it has some history. But the question that still bothers me is, what hellish thing happened in there to cause a ghost to haunt that house? The incident I want to share with you today happened in 1993. Even after all these years, I'm just as frightened today as I was then. I have never publicly spoke about this, or written about this for the fear of my safety. It has tormented my thoughts and dreams, and it has made me afraid of the dark and given me anxiety. The big questions of who and why 
still remains unanswered. In a small farming community bordering Mexico and Arizona, with a population of a bit over 5,000, there isn't a lot to do. No mall at this time, no skate parks, not even a movie theater. On this particular day, the weather was beautiful, sunny, and cool, and I did not want to be stuck at home all day, so I drove my mom to work in a nearby town and promised to be there on time to pick her up from work at 5 p.m. She reminded me not to smoke in her car, and I drove away heading back home. I ate breakfast and took a nap. About noon, I picked up a friend and we drove around for a while. Then we went to the store and purchased something cold to drink and a pack of cigarettes. We drove around and talked the usual girl talk and the latest gossip we shared with each other. When I grew tired of circling the same roads and hitting the same potholes, I headed out a couple of miles for a change of scenery. Traveling on a familiar road, I slowed down when I realized I had driven past the road I usually would take back to town. I always make it a point not to go too far, because the paved roads turn into dirt roads, and it's no place for a family car. But I said what the heck, I'll just take the next road instead of turning around. We both scoped out the unfamiliar area, a huge eucalyptus tree in a house of some kind I had never noticed. The closer we drove, it appeared to be abandoned with the door flung open and windows busted out. Nothing at all about places like that appealed to me, but my friend is shouting, pull over there, now! And I'm trying to talk her out of it, saying, no way we are stopping. I don't like places like that. She is nagging. Let's see what they left when they moved. Realizing she was not going to shut up, I reluctantly slowed down and turned into the overgrown driveway. She jumps out to curiously look inside the house. I turn off the car and get out to smoke a cigarette. I yell to her to hurry, and that I'll be waiting by the car. She calls me a chicken shit. I don't care. I finish my smoke pacing back and forth, anxious to leave. I noticed how overgrown with weeds and brush the yard had become over what looked like many years left unattended. I wandered around a bit, checking out what little was left of this old beat-up wooden trellis with dead thorny branches all twisted and woven through it. A glimpse of animal fur caught my attention, and I looked closer and noticed what appeared to be a dead coyote hanging from one of the many branches. Dried blood was matted to it, and it looked as though it had been there a while. It was gross. After a little more observation, as I'm already stepping back towards the car, I realize there are other numerous similar carcasses sprawled here and there, or hanging from branches also. Some were pelts, and others were the entire animal. I got the creeps with all those dead eyes staring at me. I had seen enough. I yell, let's go, now. I jump in the car and yell again. Get in or I'm leaving you. My friend comes running out wondering what's wrong. I point to the coyote skins. She also screams, Let's get the hell out of here. We drove back to town quiet and didn't say much. I dropped her off at her house and had just enough time to stop by my house and brush the grass out of my hair and the dust off of me before I picked up my mom. What an unusual day it had been. My mom stood outside her office. She smiled and got into the car. Obviously, she hadn't been waiting long. We go to Costco and pick up some groceries. She made the mistake of telling me to get a cart also. I loaded up with what I thought our household needed, and we met at the register. We are never doing this again, she said as she wrote a $300 check. After arriving home, we put away the groceries and I took a long shower dried my hair and dressed to go out for the evening. I fed my dog and told my mom, Bye, I won't be out too late. I drove away in a very dusty and dirty Volvo. I could have used my phone at home, but I had a habit of stopping by this small grocery store about a block from our place that had a payphone next to the store. It was very close to the road, so if I parked the car close enough, I could talk on the phone from my car. Few people had cell phones at this time. I planned to call the same friends I was with earlier. We had made unclear plans of possibly going to visit her cousin. I started to dial her number, 
when from the mirror I noticed a pickup truck coming up behind me at a high rate of speed. I stared at it in the mirror, realizing at the last minute this truck was not slowing down. With my car already running, I dropped the phone receiver leaving it swaying back and forth from the cord. I slammed it in the drive with the accelerator pressed, trying to avoid being struck from behind. I quickly sped away. Why would this driver want to hit my car? It was obvious that is exactly what was intended, considering there was no other cars on the road. He had to drive far left to the shoulder of the road to purposely get behind my parked vehicle. If unintentional, why didn't he slow down? He never even slowed down. Now he is on my tail again, and there's a stop sign coming up. I don't want to drive through it, but this guy is in a large-sized truck, the kind used to tow an RV. It is inches away from my car. If I chose to stop, or even slow down, he would ram the back of my car. At one point, I drove past my friend's house, and she looked confused as I didn't stop to pick her up as planned. Instead, I sped past with a cloud of dust and a white Chevrolet truck extremely close and viciously trying to plow into me. With no other choice, I raced through the intersection almost closing my eyes fearing another car or pedestrian might cross my path. This maniac is still no farther away. I buckle my seatbelt and sit up straight. I drove like my life depended on it, turning corners and managing not to hit parked cars or lampposts. Using only the gas pedal and seldom the brake, I reach speeds of up to 80 miles an hour on residential streets trying to get away from the psycho. With some good driving and determination, I managed to lose the son of a bitch. Driving by my friend's house again, I saw she was still standing outside. I slowed down keeping an eye out for the crazy person with a lead foot and anger issues. She quickly hopped in, not wasting any time, and I drove away. We didn't talk. I was shaking. I needed to stay focused on my driving. In a town this small, he probably wasn't too far away. It probably wasn't over. Finally, I saw a police car and I hoped he would pull me over for speeding, but that didn't happen. I knew with what I had been through tonight, I needed to tell the police, so I waved out my window for the officer to stop. When he did, I frantically told him about the truck and asked him to stay close by so he could help me because any moment he would be back to terrorize us again. The officer turned to me and jokingly said, Why don't you go home and get some sleep? I slowly drove away feeling tired, helpless, and now teary-eyed, wishing I could do just that. Go home and sleep. I spot the truck again as he drives through the intersection ahead of me, as if searching the block hunting us down. I hear his engine roar as it gains speed heading towards us again. I start to cry, thinking that this night's getting worse and worse, and about what the cop said. My friend says, stay strong and just drive like you did earlier. I took a deep breath and gained some much needed confidence. My car was still running strong and not getting hot, so I knew that I could do this. I drove around for what seemed like hours. I knew I could probably lose him if I headed out of town where I could drive faster, but I was afraid that if he managed to run us off the road, he would kill us. Then out of nowhere, it appeared to perhaps be over as this angry driver chose to turn off and disappear out of town. Still watching cautiously, I saw it was safe to finally unclench my hands from the steering wheel and slow down to a safe speed. We drove to my house, quickly got out and ran inside where it was safe. Even though it was late, my mom was waiting for me, immediately asking me what kind of trouble I had gotten myself into. I wanted to tell her about the danger I was in tonight, but I was too physically and mentally exhausted. I just sat there breathing heavy. With a very serious, but also fearful tone, my mother insists I go outside and look at my father's car. I tiptoe carefully outside to the driveway. Stretched out on the hood of my dad's car was a taxidermy quality black coyote staring back at me.
When I was about 12, my Uncle John came from Ukraine to visit us in Canada. He had a lot of stories, but this was the one that stood out. It was the late 1960s. John was traveling by train from his village to another to visit family. He had to change trains at one point and was dropped off at what amounted to a platform and a hut in the middle of nowhere. There was no one else at this station, and other than a dirt road that led off into the surrounding woods, there was nothing there. He waited for some time, but no train came. It was winter, and getting colder and darker, and just about the time he started worrying about a place to stay and some food to eat, an old woman appeared out of the twilight. She asked if he was waiting for such and such a train, and when he said he was, she said it wouldn't be along until the following day. She asked if he needed a bed for the night, and offered him a meal and a room at her house, which she said was about an hour's walk from the station. Lodging with locals was more or less the standard when traveling in this part of the USSR, and Great Uncle John wasn't looking forward to a hungry night on a cold platform, so he accepted her offer. He took his suitcase, and they set off together down the dark road into the forest. It was more than an hour away, more like two, and by the time they arrived at the woman's small, two-story house, John was tired and hungry. They went inside, and the woman lit some oil lamps and warmed some borscht for them. It was the first time John was able to see the woman clearly, and he was a bit startled to realize that the old woman was actually a man. Not wanting to pry, and too tired to care, John finished his soup and asked where he would be sleeping. She led him up the stairs to a tiny room with a window that contained a single bed and nothing else. He thanked her, they said goodnight, and she closed the door. Then she locked it, leaving him in the dark. Somewhat creeped out by this, John called to her, but she didn't answer, and he heard nothing else. Figuring he would deal with it in the morning, and thought that she had probably done it by mistake, John set his suitcase down and laid on the bed, deciding to make the best of it and get some sleep. Before he could fall asleep though, he felt the urge to go pee, and got out of bed, hoping to find a chamber pot or something he could pee in. He got onto his hands and knees and began to feel under the bed in the darkness, thinking that's where the pot would be if there was one. Instead, he found a body. Nope, my uncle said and went right to the window to see if he could exit the room that way. It was nailed shut. He knew that if he remained in this house, he was probably a dead man, but if he broke the window and tried to get away, there was a good chance that that old woman, and who knows who else was there, would hear him and come into the room before he could get away. So he did the only thing he could do. He pulled the body from under the bed, heaved it onto the mattress and covered it with a blanket then got under the bed and waited. Sure enough, about an hour later he heard footsteps slowly coming up the stairs and then towards the room. The lock clicked and the knob turned slowly. In the gloom, John saw someone move toward the bed. Then he heard several small and sickening thuds. The person had bashed the body on the bed with a large crowbar, which they had dropped on the floor right in front of John. There was silence. Then the person went out of the room, and the door was shut again. The footsteps went down the stairs, and then they silenced again. John moved from under the bed, took the crowbar, and was able to slowly pry the window open. He didn't say, but I imagine he was shitting bricks the entire time. When the window was up, he threw his suitcase out, then dove through himself not caring what was below him, only worried about what was behind. He landed without too much injury, and began to run into a field behind the house towards some lights in the far distance. It turned out to be a highway with some military and transport trucks on it, and John was able to get a ride to another village where he could catch a train. He didn't bother reporting what had happened to the authorities, since at this time in the USSR, there was a distinct chance that he would have been the one in trouble. He just thanked God he escaped, and decided the next time he traveled to visit relatives, he would take another way.
I have always been fascinated with the paranormal and creepy things in general. I enjoy watching all of those TV shows about hauntings and am a huge fan of the hit TV series Supernatural. I have experienced sleep paralysis only three times in my life. However, this experience is by far the scariest of all experiences. Let me start with some background, as it is important to the story. I am a 17-year-old female, living in the southeastern United States. I have two sisters, Grace, age 14, and Cece, age 11. I also have a dog named Molly. My house is small but it supports us. My sister's bedroom along with our parents' bedroom are all on the upper level, while mine is on the lower level. Let me further explain the floor plan or the lower level, as it is important to the story. If you walk out of my room, you are in a small hallway containing doors to the bathroom, laundry room, garage, and two separate closets on either side. The hallway opens up to the family room and kitchen. The kitchen is adjacent to the family room, and the two rooms are openly attached to each other. I am a very heavy sleeper, but I have a lot of trouble falling asleep. I sleep with a small radio that plays music, and I sleep with my door open and the bathroom light on. This light sometimes creates a shadow on the wall. This was my first experience with sleep paralysis. I am in a program called the International Baccalaureate Program at my school. The workload from this program causes me to stay awake for long periods of time doing homework and other important things for school. One night, I had stayed up till about 2 a.m. doing homework. I was very tired by the time I had finished my work and was ready to sleep. I turned off my light and walked over to my bed, jumping on it and pulling the covers over my body. I should also probably mention that at the time I was having extremely vivid nightmares and had witnessed horrifying things while asleep. As I fell asleep, I heard my phone buzz, signifying that I had got a text. I checked my phone and saw a text message from a friend of mine, Joe. I have known Joe for five years. He is ex-military, and he had been kicked out due to emotional trauma from some of the horrific things he had witnessed while deployed in Iraq. As a result, Joe is very overprotective of me. The text said, Be careful. I know those dreams have been bothering you. Love you. This was very alarming, as I hadn't told him anything about the dreams I had been having. I texted him back asking him what the hell he was talking about and how he had known about my dreams. Within 10 minutes I got a response. You know exactly what I'm talking about, Hannah. It is not like Joe to use my name like that, so this made me more uncomfortable than I already was. My head searched for an explanation. I decided that my overly tired mind was just playing tricks on me, and I went to bed. I slept for about two hours before I was awoken. I don't know what woke me up, but when I did wake up, I had a looming feeling of dread. I sat there for a while, not moving, just staring at the ceiling, thinking. Then something caught my attention out of the corner of my eyes. The kitchen light had flicked on. This is unusual, as I'm the only night owl in the family, and no one ever woke up at this hour. I attempted to turn over to get a better look, but as you probably guessed, I couldn't move. I could only move my eyes, and I was freaking out at this point. I knew that I was experiencing sleep paralysis, and was dreading the next moments. If you don't already know, sleep paralysis is often accompanied by terrifying hallucinations. I knew this very well, and was dreading their arrival. I look at the end of my bed, expecting to see something creepy there, but there was nothing. I was relieved, but still terrified, as I still couldn't move. I looked all around my room, but saw nothing. Then out of the corner of my eye, I saw it. I say it, as I have no idea what it was. Standing in the hallway, there was a black mass, somewhat resembling the shape of a man. The face had no features except two large white eyes, and the body seemed to fuse with the walls and floors around it. I tried to scream, but nothing came out. I sat there staring at it, terrified. 
it slowly moved closer to me, never breaking eye contact. It seemed to almost float as it moved closer and closer until it was right on top of me. It leaned over and whispered something in my ear that I will never forget. You should tell your sisters to be more careful, Hannah. My eyes widened and I yelled back, Get the hell away from my sisters! It stood there staring. Then out of nowhere, laughter erupted from all sides. This was no ordinary laugh. No, this laugh. This laugh was pure evil. At this point, I was scared shitless. Why my sisters? Where are they? Are they okay? Are they dead? Am I going to die? Questions like this passed through my mind as I was laying there with this thing staring at me, laughter blasting in my ears. Then, as fast as it had started, everything stopped. I could move. I got up and ran into the kitchen where the light had flickered before. However, before I could get into the kitchen, I tripped over one of the tables and hit my head on the corner. I fell on the floor, my head bleeding from a small cut on my forehead. I got up and ran into the kitchen, ignoring the throbbing pain coming from my head. What I saw, I will never forget. My sisters were both sitting on the floor in the corner of the kitchen. They were huddled together, holding each other, shaking. There was blood all over the kitchen floor where they sat. I knelt down and asked, Grace, Cece, what are you doing here? What's wrong? The second I spoke, they both turned to look at me, and the look in their eyes was pure, unconditional fear. Their faces were covered in blood. Neither of them responded to my question, but Cece lifted her finger, pointing at something behind me. Terrified, I turned around, and there was the black mass I had seen before. He started laughing again, and I screamed. Then, I woke up. I sat up in bed, tears dripping down my face, my body covered in cold sweat. I looked at the clock, and it was about 5 a.m. I did not go back to sleep, and just sat in my bed. After what seemed like hours, morning finally came, and I walked into the bathroom and looked in the mirror. And to my horror, I saw a small gash on my head where I had hit the table in my dream. Blood had dripped down my face and encrusted on my forehead. I cleaned the wound and tried my best to hide it from my parents and my sisters. I never told anyone about this and the scar is fully healed. However, I looked at my messages with Joe, wanting to confirm that I had texted him that night. None of the text messages were there. I have no explanation for the events of that night, and nothing paranormal had ever happened in my house before this experience. I had two other instances of sleep paralysis after this, but neither of them were as vivid or as terrifying. If anyone has any idea about what happened to me, please feel free to let me know. If you enjoyed this video, you know what to do. If you would like a chance to have your story featured in an upcoming video, make sure you email it to yourmaker6260 at gmail.com. So I don't know about any of you guys, but I've personally never had a sleep paralysis experience. I've heard it's extremely crazy, and by the sounds of this story and many others I've heard, it probably is. So hopefully when you go to sleep tonight, you don't have it happen to you. Sweet dreams, and thanks for watching. I'll catch you guys in the next video, and just remember to watch your back, because you never know who, or what, is watching.